All right, so I just wanted to address um, the question of like cortisol dosing when you're an Addisonian and you want to do some exercise. So I got a couple questions about that and honestly if a couple people are thinking it then quite a few and probably they are and you know there's a lot of us so I'm sure at least some proportion of us exercise. So it seems and it's sort of in my it is in my field right like I have an exercise science background and now I'm doing biomedical engineering so I think this stuff is cool and I like to exercise but yeah so to start out with um, I think the first like the best starting point for thinking about it is like going to I have a resource on my my website uh, that it's called like living with Addison's uh, like a textbook for living with Addison something like that and basically it's by a couple British endocrinologists who just kind of talk about like okay everyday life with Addison's and how you do that so it's definitely not like a biochemistry textbook or anything it's just very applicable and that is on my little uh, wordpress.com slash outlifting Addison's I don't remember exactly what the URL is so my apologies but I mean I have links to it so you should be able to find that um, yeah so in there they talk about exercise and in in that idea they basically just say all right um the first time you do an activity take I believe if I remember correctly I haven't looked at it for a little while but I think it's an extra 25 percent of what you normally take so an extra quarter if you take 20 uh, take five prior to that exercise like 30 minutes or an hour before so that way it's in your system it's in your blood and you know you're reacting or whatever you're prepared for that exercise right so they say the first time to do that the 25 percent more quarter more um, and then they say the next time take half of that so one eighth 12.5 percent um, and this is extra above your like daily baseline right so like if you took 20 a day that 25 percent is going to be five whereas if you're taking like 40 a day which i don't know if anybody does that but if you're on 40 a day and you're doing 25 percent that'd be four right so it's it's all relative to your cortisol baseline um yeah so they say first time 25 percent extra second time 12.5 percent one eighth extra then they say the third time you don't need anything um i think that's a great like initial concept right like where you come at it and you're like okay will i am i going to be equally as stressed each time i do a certain activity and the answer is no i mean and if you are then your body is not adapting like i mean body is adapt it's going to happen so so they're they're assuming the body adapts really quickly um and for me i guess i have to have a personal talk with them to see why they think that that it needs to be that quick um for me it makes a lot more sense i mean just think of it in like terms of of how people generally make uh you know like let's say physiological adaptations to impose demands right so so basically just acknowledging our bodies change according to what we do like Lance Armstrong let's say real quick just to compare these ideas so Lance Armstrong hopefully I don't know I assume most people know who he is a really good cyclist right so he rides a bike real good really far um, his heart and his lungs are designed for that his muscles are designed for that now are yeah I mean they've been adapted over decades of training um, everything is geared towards that uh, and that's going to be different so like okay Lance bikes really well but then let's say you want Lance to do a one rep max uh, clean and jerk you know like the the lifts they do in the Olympics where they just grab like 400 pounds throw it over their head Lance isn't going to be an all-star clean and jerk or Olympic lifter he's probably going to suck um, and that's just because he hasn't adapted to that like in the same idea the Olympic lifter is gonna probably be really bad at getting on a getting on a bike and riding for 
however many days the Tour de France is. I mean, they're going to be horrible at that. It's because their bodies haven't adapted. So, so in the same vein, we're talking about adaptation to whatever you're doing. Um, so you can't be like, okay, I, I walk. So that means that I can, I probably don't need to stress those when I swim or something like that. It's like, well, they're different. Um, I mean, sure, you're like generally a little bit more in shape if you're, if you walk a lot, but swimming is different. So, so I like that idea how they like kind of specified to different types of activities. Um, I guess my main complaint there is, well, why are we assuming that the body adapts that quickly in three, three times? Like, Lance Armstrong probably like rides three times throughout the day. Like he's not, um, he's not gonna be fully adapted after a day. Like your body can't make adaptations that quickly, at least not significant amounts of them. So, so to me, I really like the overarching idea, but I guess for myself and like, if I were to actually recommend some sort of regimen to people, I would say, keep the same idea, the 25% extra, but I want to make that like a span of like a month or something. So like the first month, take an extra five, well, an extra 25%, right? Um, second month, drop that down to whatever, one eighth. And then the third month, do nothing. Um, and that's also assuming that you are doing the same activity over and over. like. Like for instance, let's say you're walking at three miles an hour and you walk, um, that's whatever, um, just American units, right? If you're from Britain then I don't know, walk at six kilometers an hour. Yeah. So at the same time units, but regardless, <laughs> so it's assuming that you're going at the same speed and the same distance. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, that's what your body would adapt towards, in my opinion, whenever you're going to say like, okay, you've adapted to that. So, so when it used to be hard for you to walk quickly for a mile and now you can do it really easily, you don't get out of breath, I'd say, okay, yeah, you've adapted to that and I don't see any reason for you to take any more cortisol. You're not stressing yourself. Uh, your body's fine. So then the questions come in like, well, okay, well, what if I instead of just walking, I decide to jog. Or what if instead of just going one mile, I go two miles? And that's when this exercise science theory sort of less, more or less comes into play. So basically in exercise science, there are only really two major parameters that people are gonna modify. Um, and I'll just go ahead and say, let's call them, well, they are called, Volume will be the first one. So volume in this Dequates more or less to distance like or like how many times you did something um, So like if you're weight training and you do 10 reps, right? That's your Volume essentially is like okay. You did it 10 times. Whereas if you just did it once then um, So if you do it once that's not that much volume, right? It's one times however much weight you're using uh, if you do it 10 times, then you have 10 times more, right? But you're not changing the the amount of weight used, you're just doing it more. So like you can kind of think of that as somewhat analogous to like walking or jogging or running. And in that, in that vein, I'd be thinking of volume. Well, volume is more or less like, okay, how many miles did you go? How many kilometers, right? Um, yeah, so that's the first parameter, and, and in that thought though, volume is correlates with like how much cortisol you will be producing throughout the day. So whenever they do hair samples and whatnot, they, they look at like, okay, what's the total amount of cortisol that's been in that person's system uh, throughout the last month or whatever, however long it is that they can detect in your hair. And, and from that, they found like, Okay, people who run like, let's say 10 miles a week, they have less cortisol in their hair than people who run 20 miles a week, than people who run 50. So as you increase your mileage, you're increasing your total cortisol amount, um, 
that has to go through your system. And in the same vein, not really the same, sort of the same, you have intensity. So intensity is just like, just a simple acknowledgement, okay, uh, we can say that jogging is more intense than walking, right? So jogging, walking, we got like running, sprinting. So hopefully that makes sense. So volume is more or less distance, how many times you did something. And intensity is like, okay, how hard was it? Um, and if you're thinking that more in like a lifting type of sense, it's like, okay, um, like if you're lifting 10 pounds, that'll be like lower intensity. Whereas if you're doing like a hundred pounds, that's higher intensity. And, and keep in mind, like for us, when we're talking about, um, these things, it's relative to the individual, like your body's going to be adapting, um, at different rates than other people's. And at the same time, it's like, okay, if you've been doing something for one month versus somebody who's been doing it for a year, they're going to be a lot better adapted. They probably won't need as much um, cortisol, stress hormone to deal with it. So we have to keep those things in mind. Um, but basically I just want to say, okay, if you're doing more volume, that means you're going to need probably a higher stress dose. Um, if you're doing more intensity, you're probably going to need a higher stress dose. Um, but then also if you've been doing these things for a long time and they aren't really that hard for you, like let's say you've been walking around your block or whatever for <laughs> for the last year um, and it's not that hard then you probably don't need anything else um, and honestly your body is probably going to tell you pretty clearly if you need anything else um, and then lastly I guess one thing I want to go into with uh, when you're talking specifically about weight train, well, maybe not specifically, but like this would be most applicable to people who weight train, um, especially Tanya, if you're watching. Um, yeah, I think your name's Tanya. <laughs> I apologize if I'm not remembering that correctly, but anyway, so with that, with weight training. There are studies showing that um, the, like basically your cortisol release is going to be proportional to your rest periods, more or less. So like, so if you're doing more of a powerlifting routine where you are waiting like three, three to five minutes between sets, you're not going to release that much cortisol um, overall, period. Like throughout the entire workout, you're not going to have a large cortisol release. But whenever you get down to like more bodybuilding type of uh, workouts where your rest periods are only like one minute, 30 seconds, something like that, then you are going to start releasing more cortisol and it's going to be more or less proportional to how low your rest periods are. I'm not saying like a one second rest period is going to maximize thing. I don't know who does a one second rest period, but, um, yeah, so that's the, the general idea there. And I guess it just comes down to like how well recovered are you? And then if like if your body doesn't have time to recover between sets, then you're going to start re releasing um, cortisol. And it's Terra. Dang. Tanya gives me allergy shots <laughs> with my great autoimmune system. Um, yeah, I'm allergic to everything. But yeah, okay. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> anyway, I think this is all... Um, that's everything I can think of to say on the subject. Oh, I guess lastly for myself though. So what do I do? Basically, and I keep this in context, I, I walk like about an hour a day and it's just around campus. It's not, like to me it's not very hard anymore. Like, it's more relaxing, which I guess that's sort of, as a tangential piece of information is kind of interesting that there are some studies showing that like okay if you just go out walking or doing something uh, like an activity that's not that hard it actually decrease cortisol in your bloodstream so that's pretty cool kind of makes sense like how it de-stress people out right but 
but yeah, so I walk an hour a day, and then on top of that, I do more like bodybuilding-ish level workouts. So anywhere from like two minute rest periods to 30 second ones. And my baseline is like about, yeah, about 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone throughout the day. And I weighed it definitely a lot more towards the morning. So a lot in the morning and not very much throughout the rest of the day, just cause that matches the diurnal pattern. But we can go off of that. We can do that in some other video. Um, but yeah, so my baseline is 25 and incorporated into that actually is a 2.5 milligram um, stress dose right before working out on days when I don't like doing anything involving like squats and deadlifts. If, if I am doing squats and deadlifts, then I do five milligrams um, as a stress dose. So I have a baseline of 25 and uh, I take an extra 2.5. Well, in that 25 though, is a 2.5 that's like right before my workout. Um, so not really that much. Uh, and then I'll have a 27.5 day where I have five milligrams right before my workout and I don't change anything else about the day. So yeah, that works pretty well for me. I also eat a little more salt on days that I do like squats and deadlifts just because I sweat a lot those days. So got to replenish that sodium. Um, yeah, hopefully this has been relatively enlightening. <laughs> And if you have any questions, feel free to ask because it is a really big subject. I mean, 15 minutes to talk about exercise and cortisol and how not to die while you're doing exercise when you're an Addisonian. Um, pretty brief, but yeah, just let me know. And sorry, Tara, I totally remember it now. I should have thought about that before saying anything while <laughs> recording a video. But yeah, hope you guys have a good day.